What is silo finance? In today's video, we'll be covering everything you need to know about one of the fastest growing money market DeFi protocols in the space. This video will cover important topics such as this protocol's mission, its usage metrics, tokenomics, governance system, audits, front end, treasury, and their V2 model. There's going to be a lot of information, so feel free to skip around, but once it's done, you will have a very good understanding of how this protocol works and what you can use it for. Without further ado, let's get into Silo Finance. Silo Finance is currently one of the fastest growing lending and borrowing DeFi protocols in the DeFi ecosystem. It exists to offer users the ability to borrow and lend assets on the Ethereum and Arbitrum networks in a permissionless way. Silo Finance iterates on existing money market protocol designs by offering users risk isolated markets. We'll get more into what that means later in the video, but for now, let's take a look at how this protocol has been growing. Taking a look at some of Silo Finance's usage metrics, we can begin to see the growth and impact that this protocol has had over the past year. Cumulatively, the protocol has over $393 million in total value locked across the Arbitrum and Ethereum networks. Of that $393 million deposited, $92 million of assets are currently being borrowed. The platform so far has collected over $1 million in revenues, with almost 80% of that coming from Ethereum and the rest coming from markets on Arbitrum. This protocol has seen a slow increase in active users as well as volume over the last year, with many silos currently seeing millions of dollars in volumes individually and an aggregate of tens of millions of dollars in protocol volume daily. A February 2024 monthly report also indicates significant growth in total value locked as well as money being borrowed. It's interesting to note that most of their TVL on Ethereum consists of their Llama Ethereum markets, which are a relatively new product. These markets work by pairing borrowable assets with a bridge asset of CRV instead of Ethereum or USDC for each silo. Their biggest market for this Llama integration so far has been their CRV CRV USD market, which has over 250 million curve tokens in deposits. So clearly, Silo Finance serves a purpose, but what exactly does it do differently and what are these risk-isolated markets that we mentioned before? To understand why risk-isolated markets are so useful, you must first understand how money market protocols in DeFi actually work and what systemic risks they face. Lending and borrowing are some of the most important features available in DeFi and the markets for these services are huge. But most big lending and borrowing protocols have faced a fundamental systemic issue that puts users' money at risk. Users who borrow and lend on these protocols generally lend to a large shared pool of assets from which users borrow. The problem with this design is the risk of individual assets in the pool going bust and affecting the entire pool's health. The risk to these shared liquidity model DeFi protocols has been clearly felt through multiple hacks and tens of millions of dollars lost in exploits. Some notable mentions include Cream Finance and Venus Protocol, getting exploited for $130 million and $100 million respectively. Both of these exploits happened through manipulation of the collateral inside the pool, leading to money being stolen from depositors. Risk isolated markets are able to compartmentalize this risk by having each asset have their own lending and borrowing market and pairing them with different bridge assets such as Ethereum, Xi, USDC, or Curve USD. These bridge assets are used based on which integration users are accessing silo finance from. For legacy Ethereum markets, the bridge assets in silos are Xi and ETH. For their Llama integration, the bridge asset in silos is CRV USD and on Arbitrum, the bridge assets are ETH and USDC. By separating these asset markets into their own silos, Silo Finance is able to ensure the most efficiency and risk management for each asset. It also allows for markets to be made for more niche or high risk assets as any exploits to them would be limited solely to that market. So now that we understand the value of risk isolated markets, let's take a look at Silo Finance's tokenomics. 
Silo Finance has two different native protocol tokens that it uses to fulfill different functions across the protocol. First off is their Xi stablecoin. This token is used as one of the base assets which users can borrow from different asset silos. Xi is simply an over collateralized stablecoin that aims to always maintain a soft peg to the dollar like many other protocol native stablecoins. Its functions are controlled by the Silo DAO, which anyone can become a part of. The Silo DAO is responsible for controlling the supply of Xi by deciding which assets can be used to mint new Xi and which cannot. Borrowing Xi allows users to take advantage of some juicy yield opportunities through liquidity pools on Convex and Frax Finance. The other Silo native token that exists is the Silo token, which is currently mainly used for governance and incentives. This token can be used to vote on governance proposals on the protocol or delegated to others to do this task. Governance is done on the Silo official governance page, which I will have linked in the description. The token so far has never been inflationary, and the way Silo incentivizes lenders on the protocol is by using revenue to buy their own Silo tokens back and redistribute them to lenders. Some more stats about this token supply can be seen in their docs, including the token allocation as well as vesting schedule. Silo Finance also has their own governance system which is used to make changes to the protocol. The governance system is enabled through their Silo token, which is managed by the Silo DAO. The list of things that can be voted on through governance proposals include things like new silos, interest rate payment changes, adding or removing bridge assets, turning off or on DAO fee mechanisms, increasing token supply, directing protocol-owned assets for growth, and changing specific silo settings. In order for one of these governance proposals to pass, a set of governance parameters must be followed. Through Tally, a helpful platform for DAOs managing governance, users can connect their wallets and become delegators. The entire process is outlined in their Delegate Your Voting Power page. I won't bore you with all the specific details of governance on the platform, but for reference, users can figure out how to create new silos, proposals, delegate their votes, and see important information about the silo treasury all within their governance silopedia page. I will have all this information linked in the description for those curious. Now what about their audits? Silo Finance has undergone multiple different audits from established and reputable auditing companies in the space. Some of these include auditing firms like Chain Security, Zertora, and Quantstamp. They also have a public bug bounty program for anyone who discovers a bug and wants compensation for their work. These bounties differ in price based on the level of security threat discovered and to which systems these security threats apply. Now we can get into the Silo Finance user interface and I can guide you through how different protocol mechanics work. The Silo UI is overall pretty intuitive if you've ever used a money market protocol, but today we'll go through it so you can make sure to understand how different elements work. I'll also cover how their interest rate mechanism works so users know what they can expect to earn or pay when lending and borrowing. Start by opening the app on their main website page and you will be directed to the lending and borrowing services. Here you will have to connect with the wallet of your choice in order to access these services. After you do, you will have the option to choose between their Ethereum, Legacy, Llama, and Arbitrum integrations. These are the main categories for markets which you can choose from, and you should pick these based on the network you are operating from. Once you've decided on your integration of choice, you can begin to search for the asset silos that interest you. After you've found a market that interests you, you can click on the market icon, and you'll be brought to a page showing important information about that silo. This information includes the different amounts of assets being lent out and borrowed, the utilization rate of each asset, and the oracle tracking the asset prices. Here you will have the option to deposit assets as a lender or deposit collateral and borrow assets as a borrower. Once you've borrowed or deposited money, you will be able to see your open position on the dashboard tab. Here you will have access to all the information that has to do with your position as well as the rewards that you may have access to. Closing a position can also easily be done here by clicking on the withdraw button which will take you to the silo you borrowed or deposited from. The last thing I will mention is their interest rate model for silos. 
The interest rate which is paid by borrowers is determined by the utilization of assets in each silo. This just means that when there is a higher amount of assets being borrowed relative to the assets that are available in each silo, the interest rate rises. The interest rate is categorized in four different categories based on the utilization rate. These four categories are very low, low, optimal, and critical. Based on these categories, the interest rate for borrowing assets will slowly increase until it reaches a critical state. In this state, the interest rate will rise exponentially based on an added time factor. Looking at different assets in each silo, users will be able to see exactly what utilization rate each asset currently has along with the current APR. So what about the silo treasury? Silo Finance also has their own treasury which they use to fund different operations throughout the protocol. The most important of these being the buyback program which takes in protocol revenues and uses them to buy silo tokens off the market and redistribute those tokens back to users in different silos. A spreadsheet is available to see exactly what assets the treasury has at all times and what actions these assets are being used for. The last thing I'll cover in this video are the changes coming with Silo V2. Silo Finance recently announced their new V2 updates which are going to be bringing a lot of new changes to the protocol. Among these changes, the most important ones are changes to asset markets and the introduction of V2 markets, an overhaul of the token and governance system with the introduction of VE Silo, and last the addition of liquidity vaults. The new V2 markets are going to benefit from a lot of new custom features that will improve efficiency, add more customization to how revenue is managed, improve decentralization through added asset oracles, enable more liquidation mechanism options, and add some more technical improvements to markets such as hooks. This will also enable deployment of two asset lending markets with a handful of custom settings that deployers can choose from. Silo governance will also be seeing a lot of changes with the introduction of the VE Silo token. This VE Silo system will work a lot like other VE governance systems by having higher conviction market participants lock their tokens in liquidity pools for longer periods of time to receive VE Silo tokens. These tokens will enable a whole host of different benefits for their holders, including increased yield from markets, receiving emissions from Silo's incentive program, receiving revenue share in the case the DAO votes for revenue share to be enabled, creating different types of proposals, and voting on which markets receive more or less silo emissions. This governance system will be available cross-chain with the help of Chainlink's CCIP. This means that governance actions will be moved to an L2 to make governance cheaper for users, but it will still allow for governance from any supported network. The final major change being included will be the new silo liquidity vaults, which serve as a liquidity layer on top of the existing markets. These liquidity vaults can be used to quickly move liquidity to markets in need of it and reward users who provide liquidity to them. They work as a sort of liquidity optimizer for the protocol and ensure better liquidity for asset markets based on their needs. Included in their plans for 2024 are also some new audits and an incentive program for their new V2 markets. That's it for now. I will have all the information I use to make this video down in the description for people who want to learn more about the protocol or wish to view protocol metrics. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed and want to see more protocol guides. Until next time, stay safe Anons.